2017. The three were jointly charged with of offering basic education in an unregistered institution, contrary to Section 76. Six years ago, and I've given you the case number as a manifestation of the action taken by the authorities. He was teaching children. Preferred. Preferred. Now, he entered into a plea bargain with the prosecution, which again, as you're aware, the prosecution is an independent We must ask ourselves how far independent goes. Because, because of our trauma as a country in the past, we sought the outcomes of a plea bargain. Well, it didn't. It didn't. He was charged again the same year. He arrested the Amarbia report. So he was again arrested the second time. Remember, the first one was 14 March 2017. The second arrest on Rokuchea took place the same year after he has been told to go and behave well. A few months later, in October, six months later, the date is 17th October 2017, he was charged with four counts. And among the four counts, one of them is a serious offense. And I'm not saying the others are not offenses. They are offenses, but one of them is a serious offense. Honorable Chair and the other lawyers in the house, you know about the hierarchy of crimes. There is a hierarchy of crimes. We have most abominable crimes, both national and international laws, and they go escalating like that. Every crime is a crime, but we have a hierarchy of crimes. Among the four counts for which Mr. Mackenzie was charged with was the offense of radicalization under Section 12D of the Prevention of Terrorism Act Number 30 of 2012. As members may know, offenses under the Terrorism Act are some of the most heinous offenses and they are treated differently. So as I charge, I must praise whoever the officers were responsible for taking action, for taking them to court, for prosecuting him and charging him. They charged him under the Terrorism Act. He was also charged on the same day with other offenses now, which I consider lesser offenses in terms of the threat they pose to national security. He was charged with offering basic education in an, an unregistered institution, contrary to Section 82 of the Basic Education Act of 2013. He was also charged with failing to take his children, his own children, to compulsory primary and secondary education. As you're aware, <coughs> primary and secondary education is compulsory. And our laws, Section 30 of the Basic Education Act. And finally, was charged with failing to provide the right, the right to education to many children, contrary to Section 7 of the Children's Act, Cup 141 of the Laws of Kenya. Those were the four counts. In 2017, the second round of arrest. The first arrest has aborted because of a plea bargain. 
and then the court orders good behavior. There is no good behavior. He continues to do the same things. He's brought to court six months later, charged with a number of offenses under the Education Act, but principally with one major serious offense under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Honorable Chair, the court took a number of measures as required under the Children's Act. Court ordered that uh, children protection files be opened, uh, reports be made by the children welfare officer, and uh, curiously, curiously, chair, the court granted him bail on 19th of October. After one week, they set him free. They granted him a cash bill of 100,000 shillings. And Mr. Mackenzie was also asked, in the alternative, he didn't, if he, he didn't have a cash bill of 100,000 shillings to post a bond of half a million shillings. And other than that, he was not asked to behave well. He was asked to report to the OCS of Malindi, the officer commanding station. Malindi, once a week. The court also ordered that that matter be heard on a priority yeah. basis because, and I hear, I commend the court, the court said this was a public interest matter. Now, chair and members, one can pause there and ask a few questions. And some of this uh, provision I'm giving is answering to some of the other issues, because they are related. As I've said, I commend twice in six months attempt to bring this man to justice and to prevent him from causing harm to society. He's a religious man, he's a preacher, but we must commend our authorities, those that made sure this fellow is taken to court. Because there is a, some motto fear we have built as a society, which is also damaging. The same way I've said, as a country, there's too much reverence on institutions to allow certain institutions to be so revered that they can veer off from the national interest. Might hurt us in future. Maybe not in this generation, it will hurt us. Because the state is formed by certain primordial and basic interests that make the state exist. Without the existence of those very basic conditions, all the things we speak here about I don't know the powers of the executive, the independence of the judiciary, the paramountcy and the supremacy of parliament. They remain paper matters. And that's why I argue these things are good for democracy, but there must be a state first for us to exercise constitutional powers, for the executive to project his executive powers, for parliament to exert its sovereignty as people's representatives, for the judiciary to exert its independence as arbiters and interpreters of the law. But if there is no state, where will be the judge? Where will be the members of parliament? Where will be even members of cabinet if there is no state? So my worry as a Kenyan and as the minister responsible for our national security. I am saying, in my view, I don't see the basis why, in the first instance, where a fellow who was indoctrinating children entered into a plea bargain, 
simply because we can't ask the prosecution questions because they're independent. And then the judge sets them free to cause more danger and harm to the society. Right? But I must commend those who make sure there is a bit of accountability. Six months later, there's an improvement. The judge says this is a matter of public interest. It should be had in priority basis. The judge also says that uh, at least he must, uh, he will not just be released like that. Let them, uh, let him uh, pay a cash bill or post bond. But small amounts of money which he paid and went back again to cause the same harm. 2017, six years ago. One may pause there also and ask, why Mr. Mackenzie and his co accused were not detained under the Prevention of Terrorism Act for which they had been charged? Because that act allows the prosecution to hold and the police to hold a suspect for as long as possible, up to one year at a time because of offenses under the terrorism act. So it is okay, the decision to charge him with the terrorism related offenses and like radicalization was good, but it had no effect. The courts released the fellow, despite the fact that he's being charged under terrorism. And maybe we can excuse the judiciary because from the record and from my investigations, in other words, the court, after listening to the prosecution, arrives at a decision that the accused has no case to answer and therefore should not be put on their defense. They said, Mr. McKenzie, And you know, unless, unlike a release under Section 87A, where the person can be arrested and discharged, once a release is under Section 2, um, uh, uh, 15, they were not, they are not put on defense, and therefore the, the matter ended at that stage. And Mackenzie found freedom to go back. Honorable Chair, were reports done? Yes, they were done. Many reports. Mr. Mackenzie had a third was charged in Malindi criminal case number 366 of 2019 with three counts. One, inside will be the law. Yet our constitution says the rule of law is a cornerstone, foundational principle for the existence of the state. So, yeah, it's, it's an anarchist. He believed that uh, people should not obey the law. And he's a preacher sent by God to make sure that people don't obey the law. And yet they're in Kenya and we have a constitution. He was also charged with being in possession and distributing films to the public which had not been examined and classified contrary to section 12 of the Films and Stage Plays Act, Cap 222 of the Laws of Kenya. Thirdly, he was charged with operating a filming studio 
and producing films without valid filming licenses from Act Cup 222 of the laws of Kenya. The court granted the accused person a cash bail who has appeared before me not once, not twice. This is the third time. The offenses appear quite what is very concerned and look very So, the appearance of Mr. Mackenzie before court at the moment is the fourth appearance, the fourth appearance. And it was triggered by two children who died on 28th March 2023 and were buried in shallow graves which were discovered thanks to citizens, Kenyans, society who helped us discover because that is what triggered the current uh, security measures that you are taking there. We are coming in very late. They were starved to death and buried in shallow graves within Mr. Mackenzie's farm. Suggesting that Mr. Mackenzie did not own the farm. That's neither here nor there. I can confirm to you. The ownership of that farm is, is, is a complicated matter. But Mr. Mackenzie, please, between himself and some people purporting to be residents of that area, whether those people are there. had physical possession, had, whether in, in real or purported terms, acquired the entire 800 acres and was in possession of certain contractual arrangement between himself and people who purported to own that land for purpose of criminal of April, of March, sorry, 2023. And, um, And 38 bodies. Just, just for record, I remember yesterday I said 339, there are 338 bodies. By yesterday, by evening yesterday, another 12 were recovered, so it's 350. And we have approximately 40 graves. are holding multiple bodies. I also confirm, Chair, that we have not exhausted our search for graves. And therefore, we do not know how long it will take because we cannot just rush. We are following the Geneva Protocol the processing of mass graves and the protocols under international law 
on handling scenes of crime where atrocities have been committed. So it's a very slow process. From the look of things, they could be holding multiple bodies. And we have not exhausted. I also want to bring to the attention of this committee chair with regard to the activities inside the forest. I know my sister, the Cabinet Secretary for Public Service and Gender, was the Member of Parliament of that area and had a bitter fallout as the MP. Sure. It is not the law enforcement agencies. Because as I have shown, we were arresting him, taking him, he is released, we arrest him. When he entered that forest at the end of 2019, early 2020, some, and, 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 and let me put it this way, National Park at Salagate. Park Salagate, the national to the Sabo East National Park is less than ten kilometers from the entrance. Uh, for this operation, and the entire of that uh, Chakama Ranch, uh, the fifty thousand acres, the ownership notwithstanding it's a very forested area it's a thicket and it's no settlement as i've said it's actually the last settlement is in the area called Bofu. so when he was uh, running away from he wanted to settle around Bofu. if the committee has gone there they understand where mm -hmm. Bofu is mm -hmm. Yes, Senator. I, I think the presentation by the CS is very flowing. Uh, yesterday, Chair, you know, we were with the peers from land and so on. Will I be in order to propose uh, through you, Chair? Because, you know, the CS also had a get before this committee much earlier. And it really took us through some of those, uh, what he said now. Uh, would it be not a chair if I question um, he can confine his presentation to what is what is uh, what is in this what is in this report? Um, because I think he has cleared item number one, he was to go to item number two. And um, because the, the issue of ownership as you saw yesterday we discussed so extensively and 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 I understand him. He is a man of details uh, because he is serious with his work. But if you can perhaps restrict to this so that we are able to go back, it's just my, my, um, my proposal. Uh, yes, uh, maybe, Minister, you can uh, make progress because there, there, there are other questions that we had sent to you that needed clarification. So you can uh, finish up on that so that we can interact uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the guidance. Um, I can be long, but I can be also very brief. That's 
brothers. <laughs> um, I did not finish the first question. There's a reason why I'm explaining why Mr. Mackenzie settled at Bofu before moving to the forest, and it's in connection with the first question. So I'm very clear in my mind. But if the committee feels that you do not have the time or they don't need that information, I cannot refute it and then finish. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Actually, I think um, the, the CS is connecting the dots. So I feel strongly that we should let it flow. Let us give him his time. He's here actually uh, before us to give us that. Because I think only later we'll realize where he's coming from that will connect from what we had yesterday and today, then you know, then we we'll really, I think for me now I'm getting to understand better how it came about. So I feel strongly that it should not be denied the space letting go. Okay, so honorable members, let's, let's not interfere. Let's just let the information flow and then we'll have our time to ask the question. Uh, Senator, uh, uh, not Senator, but uh, honorable minister. <laughs> Let's proceed. Take your time because we need the, all the information you have, and then we shall interact with you. Thank and I might not on the chair. So the the title of senator is the only title within the elected leadership that you carry for life, and maybe that of president. So when you call me senator, you are right because <laughs> <laughs> that title is a life. Uh, title, just like president. <laughs> no, CS is different. These are the things, uh, <laughs> former. So, thank you. Thank the guys, Chair. I'll, 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 I'll be somewhere in the middle. The reason why, Chair, I wanted to bring out this is that, again, the public, just to show how the public has, is ahead of even government. When he started propagating his things, and they had heard what had happened in Malik, they chased him, and then that's when now he ventured into the forest. Mm -hmm. And in, in, with regard to question number one on the report, in 2020, certain people who claim to have the title date of Shakamaraj, and I'm not saying there's nothing, I'm not I'm imputing anything wrong with that title date. I'm talking now from a criminal justice perspective, from a criminal prosecution point of view. Anybody in control of a property, even if they are lawfully or legally owning it, it's, it's, it's immaterial. If you can show I'm the one who was controlling the space, there is some responsibility that can be visited in me if I'm the one in control of this space, whether I own it or not. So. And then there was another set now of people having title deeds, the owners of Chakamara as per title deed, which is a completely different issue. They made a report at the Langobaya police station, which is a police station just outside the Chakamara in 2020. And this is important. And they said, we have witnessed suspicious characters inside this forest. And again, the committee has been there. This ranch has been, and not really, it's been open for herders from even other counties. They come with camel, they had, they have some agreement with whoever they had. But this report, made by the directors of Chakama Ranch Limited was very particular. I said, we are not talking about the herders who graze their cows and, and, and camels here. We suspect there are characters here who are doing suspicious things. And we are seeing people moving in, moving out, and the way the business is being conducted inside this forest we fear that there could be something, some commission of crime happening. That was in 2020. No action was taken in 2020. On that particular report, no action was taken in 2020, 2021, 
2022-2023. And that is important for this committee. Because that was a report now not targeting a suspect in Malindi, elsewhere, inside this forest where the massacres occurred. Some Kenyans went and said we suspect people here in a particular police station. And I'm sure that police station has an OB. And so in terms of accountability and so that we don't everybody for, you know the way we do it Kenyan style everybody is bad we, we, the committee must also look at ways of pinpointing specific lapses and exonerating public officials security agencies or officers who, who did their work in the circumstances I believe the National Police Service not the entire service, but some officers will have a case to handle, and other organs of security. I believe if at some point, and we'll get there. So, there was a report at Lango by a police station in 2020. It has never been acted until today. And this report was particularly about the activities in Shakaola Forest, meaning if the kind of efforts which had been done previously could have been done on this particular report, maybe the Shakaola massacre could have been prevented or at least mitigated. It's my view. Those are the actions taken. That is number two. Because number two was what actions the officers took with regard to the complaints made by leader by residents and leadership. I've answered that question. It took too long for security agencies to act on the complaints raised by locals. I've answered that question. In some instances, it took a short period of time. We acted. We prosecuted. We took people to court. We prosecuted the matter, they were released, we acted. But on the last one, we, we took forever, and we have no reason why taken this. So again, it's up to this committee to know who to interview. Um, suspects. And others are very good witnesses who will help us. Without repeating myself, Chair, let's not bungle the prosecution. No one will be forgiven for trying to matter. Unlike all other matters, this is a national security matter. I have told the ODPP, we must win. We can't lose. We must win this case. We must win. If we lose this one, I don't know what we expect as a country. So I have answered number three. Number four, was there intelligence? Yes. It's intelligence that led to this arrest. But on the final matter around the forest, there was no intelligence. It meant we are closing in. establishing why there was no intelligence. Reports were made by Kenyans, but there was no intelligence, I can confirm. There was no intelligence. Especially 
the very delicate parts where our people religious organizations from engaging in uh, extreme indoctrination of their followers, including radicalization. Honorable Chair and members, we must face it. Our country is a country that is founded on the doctrine of religious freedom. And that freedom should be treasured at all times. It should never be violated. the national anthem, O oh God of all creation, then we continue the rest of it. Because uh, the national anthem actually is part of our constitution, by the way, the preamble. Therefore, religious freedom, from where we sit as organs of national security, we believe religious freedom is a foundational doctrine of the existence of our country and it doesn't matter what that foundational doctrine must never be eroded, defiled or curtailed. Number two, in terms of solutions, this freedom this foundational freedom, which is the bedrock of our constitution. Like all other foundational doctrines of our constitution, are curtailed. And they are curtailed by about four qualifiers. All the freedoms, including the democratic rights, which we enjoy as a country, the freedom of worship, the entire Bill of Rights, all those fundamental principles of our country's establishment are curtailed first by public safety. Two, justice. Three, morality. Public morality, not individual morality. That's why you have laws that curtail certain things that appear to be promoting expression of people's freedoms for purposes of guarding our collective public morals as a society. But also all those freedoms, including movements and speech, religion, they are not they are not absolute. They are curtailed by the need to promote public security and safety. That's why you have freedom of movement. But when there is a, a security emergency, that freedom of movement will be curtailed and the government will rightly impose a curfew and say you cannot move from A to Z. They have not taken up the right, they have just limited that right, curtailed it for purposes of public safety and public order. Therefore, in terms of this hallowed bedrock principle of religious freedom that is at the core of our country's constitution, going forward, this exercise must be some circumscribed by the need to protect collective security 
in our country. And I am very clear in my mind, we must change from the current laissez-faire approach to reverence to religion, to a point where we allow our religiosity and our belief in God to allow members of our society to hurt the society, to kill them, to exploit them, to manipulate them, to indoctrinate them, all those aspects, when they come through religion, must be arrested by the law. We must prevent ministers of religion from using this important right to freedom of worship and freedom of religion, from using that space to cause social harm. And there's nothing unconstitutional about that. The freedom to worship and to religion does not include the freedom to kill people or to take their property or to torture them or to expose them to degrading treatment. That is the future. And so, all the things we have said, we will push them through as government. It doesn't matter who opposes them, we will push them through. No preacher or priest or kavi or rabbi will be allowed to preach. And in the course of preaching, they are killing people, they are torturing them, they are aiding them to commit suicide. Those are illegal activities. Those are not religious activities. So we'll push in legal reforms to make it difficult for criminals to use the holy scriptures and the religious basis to hurt our society. It doesn't matter who opposes them. We will push through as this government as one way of showing remorse as a country and how we have been careless to allow the kind of laws we have incurred in Shakahola. I am told from dealing with this matter, there are other sects somewhere, there are other places of worship which are doing worse things. Every time you know, people say, oh, you know, don't touch the men of God, don't touch, I don't know the churches. Those people who are doing those things are criminals, and uh, there's no difference between them and uh, the al Shabaab who are killing our people, or the bandits who are killing our people. Uh, we will treat them as such, we'll make new policy and uh, regulatory framework to make it impossible for criminals to use the religious space to hurt people. We must insist on some form of self-regulation so that there's some authority of believers whose faith congregates around similar beliefs to help us to know who is doing what they believe in and who is not doing what they believe in. The law will have to address that. And then we strengthen the enforcement of the law. That is our weakest point, Honorable Chair. Law enforcement is our weakest point. And when I mean law enforcement, I don't just mean the work of the police only. It's part of the law enforcement. The other institutions, for example, the Registrar of Societies had been informed that Mr. Mackenzie's activities were endangering national security. Uh, I think that was some times back, and the date is in my written uh, statement. When that information was availed to the Register of Societies again, so we must strengthen law enforcement. This idea that somebody can wake up and preach anything, anywhere, anyhow, and do whatever they want simply because they are reading some scriptures will stop. They will not be allowed. <laughs> we 
you must tell us what you preach. Because if you write down the things you, you believe in and the things you preach, then we discover part of it is to torture people, to kill people, to brainwash them, to radicalize them. We will not register you. We will arrest you and put you in. 99.9% of religious organizations in this country for more faiths. We believe as government are doing a beautiful thing for this country. They help people in their personal matters. They assist families that would have been broken without the intervention. Some of them are running education programs through their schools. Others are running uh, training uh, 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 programs, water programs, and, and therefore and, and all faiths, Christian, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, all faiths, 99.999% are doing a good thing. But the 1% that is damaging is so little that one success of their bad act is a shakahona. And those ones will er eradicate them for, from our country. We will, those are criminals. So the best, the, so the, the there must be a mix of government regulation, self-regulation, something in, in between, but it's not optional. So for those who are saying we must uh, retreat and uh, leave this space and uh, leave it completely and let the religious organizations manage themselves, we will not. Because when this all happens, like in this case, the blame squarely lies on the government of Kenya. Not on any other person. You can see the religious people, they have gone back to their places, they occasionally talk once in a while, and even in that talk they are trying to defend their space. The responsibility, the back stops with the government of Kenya. And for good reasons. I hope you'll be able to talk to the judiciary. I really hope so. These are two arms of government, but even the executive and parliament are two arms of government and we are talking. I don't think there is an arm of government that cannot talk, because they don't have their own country. We all share one country. If there is insecurity, everybody will be hurt. Does even a judge can get hurt. Even a judge is exposed to crime. So I hope you talk to the judiciary because we have issues there and we would want to respect but we there are some we need we need to engage with them number six i have answered it about the regulation again i have answered it Number seven is any other information. And since I've talked for long, Chair, I don't have any other information unless it is particularly requested for through the intervention of members. I want to committee to do its work and I will not withhold any information that can assist you to make recommendations that can help our country. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, now um, we are going to interact with you and your report. Uh, Honorable members have several issues they will seek clarification, that I'll have the first uh, bite of the cherry. I wanted to know from you, um, uh, at some point in your presentation, you said that um, curiously, I use that word curiously, the, um, the suspect Mackenzie was released uh, on a cash bill after uh, incarceration for one week. 
And then you went on to say um, that he was already charged under the Prevention of uh, Terrorism Act. And uh, I think th how I'm getting you is that uh, th they should have held him uh, because there is a provision for that there. The question I want to ask is Prevention of Terrorism Act seems to be for the very, very comprehensive uh, presentation in response to the issues raised by this committee. Um, this Mackenzie is indeed a very interesting Kenyan because in those three years, Acts of Parliament, the Children's Act, the Education Act, Prevention of Terrorism Act, the Penal Code, <laughs> and Films and State Play Act. Uh, I think this is one of the Kenyans that should be recorded as having been able to break within a short time so many laws of the country. But that is why we have a problem in Shagahola, uh, Buenos Aires. Now, I agree with you that Mackenzie should not have been released under cap, under Section 210 of CPC. It should have been actually Section 87. But that is the failure of the prosecution. Because there was no objection by the prosecution even to object to the release of Mackenzie instead of being detained pass on the provisions of the Professional Terrorism Act as said by a member here. So Chair, this is where we have a problem that those people in charge <coughs> of the security in that area. So the, 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 the office of the public prosecution is already on the line here. So the officer in charge the prosecutor already from where I sit. I now don't know whether this will be a, your witness or will be an accused person, but already, Chair, you see why we're insisting of seeing these people. <coughs> so that this prosecutor should be able to tell this committee why he did not do what he was supposed to do. But that's something already directed, so <laughs> we will deal with it when we reach there. So, um, what, do, what is your view on that, uh, Chair? Do you, do you think this? Uh, and, and I think actually you have already answered that question, so that is an observation I've made. But the last one now is I want to pick your mind on what you th do you think should be the policy on land ownership? Because Shagahola and that line around there was 100,000 acres owned by a company. 50,000 was sold, leaving a balance of 50,000 acres. And in our discussion yesterday, on the CS, through our chair, we made a very big observation that the fastness of that area, not being developed and owned by individuals, created a very um, a very conducive environment for these activities to be done by, by McKinsey and so on. What is your thinking on that? Because the, uh, the, the absentee land, the, the, the absentee land owners, whom we know and those whom we don't know, in a way tend to create an environment. In Baringo, for example, and other areas where you keep on fighting us, I mean helping us to fight to fight the, the, the criminal areas. These fellows live in those bushes. In some, in some counties, these are land owned by people. I want to pick your mind on that issue of what should be our policy as a country in terms of people owning a lot of land which is not being utilized and creating environment for criminals like the one which happened here, Shagahola. Your presentation was so exhaustive that I may not need to give more 
uh, <coughs> I still want to give you uh, our support as a, as a committee, and we hope that um, you talk the four things where you curtail freedoms of people, safety, morality, security. I know the fourth one was what? Order. And I think, Chair, those are areas which this committee will be able to really utilize as we come up with our report. Because you realize that religious leaders are really completely objecting to the issue of government regulating um, uh, charges. So I think we have a very strong foundation based on the presentation by the PS. So, Chair, I will be leaving shortly to, to chair my committee, but um, I want to appreciate the CS. The uh, CS, you have the floor. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Distinguished Senator from Baringo County. He's also my professional senior, actually, both of you. Um, Chair, yeah, we are starting with your inquiry. Um, yes, curiously, suspect Mackenzie was released under Section 210 without even being put on his defense. Even if he had been charged with a very serious offense under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, that is why we are saying curiously. Um, as you look at law reform chair, part of our ability to control this space of dangerous crimes, wherever they come from, dangerous crimes coming from terrorists, from bandits, from drug traffickers, and those who meddle with the public health and safety through selling drugs and psychotropic substances, whether the dangers are coming from religious extremists and fundamentalists like your committee is hunting, we must look at what else that is not in the available Kenyan and international laws that responds particularly to this issue of religious extremism and dangerous doctrinal uh, impartation of our populations. And now I recommend either through a miscellaneous uh, legal amendments of miscellaneous laws, the penal code, the prevention of uh, terrorism act, the prevention of genocide acts of 19 of 2008, and so forth. You can have a miscellaneous statute law amendment on all those laws, including the criminal procedure code, Count 75. That is one way, so that whatever is unique about religion can be processed through a statute law miscellaneous. And that will bring on board also the regulatory bodies like the Registrar of Societies and, and so forth and so on. And in your... We must, as a country, if we have to save the future, because we have already lost the present. And I am saying we have lost the present <coughs> chair because it's a great loss to the country. Even lose one, one person who is lost to a criminal is a big loss to a country. I know of countries that even go to war with other countries because of the loss of one soldier. But I think this I don't know what has happened. We, we look at some of these things as natural. You know, people have died. We're just excavating every day and counting bodies of children and women and men. And it's as if it should be happening. So we must escalate these criminals who are hiding in religious spaces and package them to where the most dangerous criminals 
are kept in our laws and under international law. And this issue of people being released on cash bail when they are being suspected or they are being processed of very serious crimes, we have to look at it. I'm now handling a request. Kenya is handling a request now for the repatriation of someone who has been in a foreign country for the last 20 years under detention in, uh, I can even name the country, the United States of America, one of the most, the people say is one of the most democratic countries in the world. A Kenyan national who has been under investigation for 20 years, 20 years, since 2003, for being suspected of terrorism. And after 20 years, they have cleared him. I would rather we take precaution and save the society than to be too liberal. <coughs> and then our work is to bury people's children, spouses, relatives, as if it's a casual thing. So when we do the statute, as if you find that uh, an approach, the punishment bit must, must accompany it, and also the procedural rigor the procedural rigor attached to the dangerous crimes or people suspected of dangerous crimes in the religious space and those who are doing indoctrination. That is my view. To respond to, uh, you also asked whether we should have a new genre of offenses. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe because in the process of this inquiry, you're going to discover things we may not be aware of because this is a special moment and this, this has not happened before. And by the way, Chair, since Kenya's independence, this is the worst security breach in the history of our country. This is the greatest attack on our national security in Kenya's existence. Is that serious? So, as you, as you process this, because it's a unique moment that you're talking to so many people, you might want to create a new genre. But I submit that we have enough laws. We just need to enforce them. This country, Article 25 of the Constitution says that we owe international treaties and conventions to which Kenya is a party, are a part of the laws of Kenya. So we enforce international law in our courts effortlessly. Part of the laws include the laws on terror, the prevention of terror, which are international treaties we have signed, including the 1999 uh, convention, UN convention, on, on, on the prevention and suppression of terrorism. It's part of the law of Kenya. Kenya is also a state party to the United Nations uh, Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Looking at the, all the facts in the uh, Mackenzie matter, genocide is, is f all the four ingredients of genocide can be proved, even when you are closing your eyes. Now, the Genocide Convention, as it is called, of 1948, is part of our law. So why bring another law? You just enforce it because of Article 25 of the Constitution that uh, en enables our judges to apply that convention which treats those crimes yeah, in that manner. But I don't rule out new ideas that you will uh, uh, capture as you talk to people. Finally, on what um, my senior, the distinguished senator for Baringo, has asked, um, I agree, he, he should have at least the facts should have assisted uh, those who are making decisions to make sure that at least this person is put on defense. So part of the problem, weak, weak attention by the ODPP on, on some of these very serious threats to national security, these serious crimes. 
but also the judicial, the judicial part is, is an important thing. I note also with surprise, unless I am informed otherwise, that no appeal was ever lodged against the acquittal. If he was acquitted by the magistrate in Malindi, under Section 210, a prosecutor should have gone to the High Court and appealed against that acquittal. It has never been done. <coughs> Let me put it this way, Chair. We are staring at a huge crisis as a country until when we realize that we all live freely, work in this country because it is safe and secure to do so. And put security where it belongs, security first. All these other things, you can transform the economy, you can do many other infrastructure development, but a country can come tumbling down once because of security issues. And I think we have not reached there. And finally, um, the issue of land ownership. I believe, Chair, if this committee will have, in its wisdom, decided to recommend legal reforms, whether through standalone statutes or through statute law amendment bill, In line of what the distinguished Senator for Baringo has suggested, which I support, owners of land must be visited with vicarious liability. It is an old principle for the lawyers in the house, the rule in Raylards versus Fletcher must apply to owners of land. You are an owner of some bush, some land somewhere. It is your responsibility to make sure, because it's private property, and you know they are, because again of freedoms, even security agencies are limited in what they can do in your space, in your house. They must have a reasonable reason. They must even get a search warrant sometimes because of the right to privacy. So this is your private land. We will not violate it, but you must also take responsibility for what is happening there. It cannot be a hideout for dangerous criminals, and then you come with telling us this is your private space. It is your private, so long as the law and order is uh, established and uh, respected. could even come through the penal code, but also through even the land laws. There's nothing wrong with the land laws, uh, even having a bit of, uh, you know, responsibility, even uh, visiting liability on land owners, because it's a huge problem. I agree with Senator uh, uh, Tumo, and perhaps that is something the committee should consider as part of the legal reforms for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, Senator uh, Eddie wants to take the floor, but as he, as he takes the floor, uh, um, I, I am uh, feeling the, the way your, your presentation is on the office of the ODPP. So as you, as you are you're answering Senator Eddie's, you probably uh, want to tell us initially, as you and me know, uh, and all the lawyers, all prosecutions and prosecutorial power was vested in the office of the Attorney General. It may be for good reason that they were also briefed in other things like national security. In this one, I feel the mood of the presentation was that there was a bungling in terms of the. Uh, uh, application of the law in the office of the ODPP. So I wanted you, as you're answering the uh, senator here, to tell us, would you be comfortable 
or is it your recommendation that we should have a return to prosecutions on issues only regarding public security, you know, <coughs> mass public security, be returned back to the Attorney General? Is that your thinking? Would it be a better way to work and then we leave the ODPP with some, the, the normal prosecutions, but when it comes to huge uh, public security issues, the, 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 that prosecutorial power should go back to the Attorney General as it was in the olden times. Just um, uh, think about it as Senator Eddie puts his question. Uh, thank you, Chair. And also thank you, CS, for a very elaborate presentation. Uh, let me take this opportunity also as a member of this committee uh, who have having visited Shakaola with the team under the leadership of our chair. Um, and I must say that uh, in the circumstances we find ourselves in as a nation, I must commend you for the job you continue to do. Um, it is indeed commendable given the circumstances and the nuances that you find yourself in. Uh, I just wanted to interrogate just three quick thoughts uh, in the presentation that you've given us here, just to help us uh, when we'll be at some point in the course of this exercise that we have been given by the Senate, uh, we'll be tiring to do our reports. Uh, perhaps you could help us understand these three thoughts, and the thoughts are expressly so, uh, indicated in uh, point number three, point number five and point number six. So I'll start with point number three. The quest that we had here was the reasons it took too long, uh, too long for security agencies to act on the complaints raised by locals. Uh, perhaps the thought that I want to get here, uh, CS, whether in our current security infrastructure or Going forward, I like the word that you use that we have lost the present, but we must now save the future. What is the status of our disaster readiness and preparedness with regards to this nature of crimes? Because I don't think that the issue raised uh, by any persons who find themselves in this situation, whether locals or alarms from other different quarters, the response will be limited to just arrest and prosecution. That can sometimes take longer. Sometimes it defines why we have had such a long time even saving people who we could have saved if we had a proper strategy in terms of readiness and preparedness in terms of response. So that, that's something I would, I would want to know uh, with regards to this, uh, given and, and put in mind that you're still trying to save some people who have, run, who have run from where they were initially going deeper into deeper forests. So that would be one. Number two will be on point five. We had uh, a quest here on the proposals for preventing religious organizations from engaging in extreme indoctrination of their followers including radicalization and spiritual and financial exploitation. And uh, your response, or rather your guidance, uh, has been very much church-centric, if I may use that word, uh, for lack of a better word. I see your proposals here are uh, very much church-centric, you know, um, how we should uh, have churches, paths, evangelis evangelistics, uh, being in fellowships, uh, you know, individual ownership of churches should be banned through the throughout the country. All other churches must be required to avail their doctrines, etc., etc. Et Is this an assessment that other religious organizations are not at risk? And uh, would we be out of your recommendation? if perhaps we could modify these recommendations to read religious readers. Because it would be my view that the same extremism, whether the danger is with us now or could be in the future, could just as well be found in other religious organizations or religious societies. 
that includes Muslims, includes Baha'i faith, includes Hindus, includes pagans like there are many of them that some of them have got these also extremist um you know doctrines that perhaps might not have led up to this kind of security situation but in your spirit of saving the future will it be okay for this committee to take your responses here in context of larger religious organizations in the society and lastly, CS, you had, we had a quest here on proposal regarding a regulatory framework to govern religious organizations. And uh, your response was that perhaps the presidential tax force on the review of the plan um, of the legal and regulatory framework governing religious organizations would perhaps be best placed to give us an insight in this. Indeed, I don't dispute that, but it's my view that perhaps this particular body will be able to contribute, but not be able to give us the, what I'll call, holistic view with regards to this framework. And I think that perhaps I wanted to interrogate this further in the context of what I would call in law deterrence. Because your proposals have been mostly towards prevention. And I know that prevention and deterrence seem, seem to be close, but on a legal framework basis, they're actually separate. So I'll give you for instance, if you have put in place a number of precautionary strategies to make sure that we cannot face these kind of problems again, for instance, what you proposed here, like having religious organizations, having doctrines and registered and with the, with the resource society or even having relevant certificates, that would be amazing prevention mechanisms. But deterrent could perhaps go to what the chair was asking. What, for instance, should be the commensurate punishment to somebody like Mackenzie, who, if found liable, what could be the commensurate punishment that if anybody else was to see that this is the punishment this person has gotten for doing this kind of behavior legally, then they will be deterred, prevention mechanisms notwithstanding. I, I, I would want to see your, your ideas on that. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, CS. Uh, uh, CS, there's a request uh, that you take at least one round of questions. So just take notes. Thank you. Am I, can I request? I would rather, I'll try to be brief. I would rather answer one after the other so that we, the, the danger is that if there are too many, something will get worse. Okay, okay. Then take those. Take those. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for accommodating me. Chair and members, um, the logic of removing the powers of uh, the public prosecutor from the Attorney General of the Republic is a logic which is justifiable and which is uh, based on international best practice in many jurisdictions of the world. It will be a clawback of our democracy to again return the powers of the public prosecutor to the Attorney General of the Republic, in my humble view. This is why. The Attorney General is the chief legal advisor of government, period. The work of the Attorney General is to advise government agencies so that they conduct their activities within the law. The public prosecutor has a unique role of ensuring that uh, the criminal justice is realized in the country. It's a completely different role it will be a clawback on our democracy to try and lump the powers of the chief legal government advisor with those of the public prosecutor together. First of all, it's not neat already. Even whatever is left of the Attorney General, that mandate is overwhelming on the state law office. You can imagine the number of legal advisories, 
by everyone in every ministry, department, agency across the Kenya on a daily basis. They are doing a contract here, a tender here, an administrative issue here. It's overwhelming. We've just passed in cabinet. Uh, recently, I think it will come before uh, the Houses of Parliament. Uh, 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 position uh, on um, decentralization of the office of the Attorney General. They can deliver. Sometimes we blame institutions, yet the capacity has been held back. So in a nutshell, it will be wrong doctrine to claw back on the advancement of the 2010 Constitution of separating the chief legal advisor's office, who is the Attorney General, with prosecutor. Initially they were together. So already even what is left is overwhelming. The solution is again other than the usual issues about capacity and more personnel and more resources, which is the song of every Every ministry, every department across government, not just in Kenya, in all countries, it's about how oh, we need more capacity, we need more resources, and I'm not underestimating the role of resources and capacity in delivery of services. But this is my view. If I were the public prosecutor of Kenya, if I were the Attorney General of Kenya, let's give those two examples because they are the ones which have been raised on the floor here. There are certain matters because of their gravity, because of their gravity, those matters with or without capacity and resources and all the other things that are lacking, that must be handled seriously, carefully, and at the highest level. I'll give you an example. Why we've been losing so many cases is because you have matters like this, of this type, the Mackenzie type of matters. And you'll see, and I've nothing against the younger advocates and the younger, you know, some of the young advocates are very good people, including prosecutors. But there are some things that cannot be process in any other way. Your chair, you're a legal professional, and you know the meaning of seniority in the legal profession, even in terms of persuasion of the judiciary. You know what it means. And there are some things which you cannot cover them up. The reason why we have senior counsel in the bar is because they hold a certain card that only a senior counsel holds that card. The judge is forced to be patient and even when the judge is uncomfortable to be respectful. The senior counsel to make their cases, they can even address the court for hours. <coughs> Which a young advocate who was admitted last night will even be dismissed before they greet the judge. Especially if the judge has woken up with the, you know, maybe they are stressed and you know they are also human beings. And there are things which on the senior council, even within the senior council, there is the order of seniority. There are some lawyers who will get away with anything. Well, I remember during my practice days, there is uh, one of our colleagues who passed on, the oldest advocate who, at that time. And he would come to court late, 30 minutes late, and uh, sit down, of course, the other matters will be put aside and his matter will be called. And, and he wakes up and says, oh, judge, I'm sorry, I am late because I was attending my wife's birthday. And because the, the judge is the grand student of uh, this fellow, there is nothing he can do. What am I saying with regard to ODPP, chair? I believe matters like this must be prosecuted by the director of public prosecution in person. There are matters which 
I would expect that the Attorney General of the Republic must prosecute them in person, <laughs> because they are lawyers. That way, of optics, the country and the justice system, even the judiciary, which is dispensing justice, is aware this is how seriously we are taking this matter. You send a young lawyer to handle a complex matter of monumental implications <clears throat> on our justice and security system. Some young lawyers there, this is their lawyers. How do you expect to win that case? So the improvement must be within the existing institution. The ODPP is the right structure, is the right institution. But I'm afraid, even as much as the, there are legitimate grievances on how we could improve service delivery, I am not persuaded at the moment as a country, and I'm not blaming any particular state official. We are not taking matters seriously. This country chair has this unfortunate culture of people in high positions enjoying the privileges of office and not taking up the responsibilities of that office. And it's a cross board. There are so, big, so many big men and women in this country. And they are so big, some matters, they think all those are small matters, they will only appear when is necessary. I, I would argue, and I don't know whether that be, should be part of the prosecution policy of the country. I hope once we review the prosecution policy of the country, it will pass through the Houses of Parliament and it will be debated. Certain matters must be handled directly and personally by the director of public prosecutions in person. There is seniority, there is clout, there is experience, there is leverage. <coughs> So you will not lose them. But returning matters to the AG will even complicate the matter because it's already swamped with, uh, with a lot of work in uh, giving routine advisory to government and also the civil litigation side. Then Senator Okech asked about uh, our preparedness. I, I think our problem is not about preparedness. Our problem is elsewhere. It's about the efficacy of our institutions across the board. Um, and the problem is, again, our lack of adequate institutional patriotism to know that every institution plays a part in our society, in our democracy, and they must deliver. There is a, a bit of a gap in that area, and I could try to read the mind of the distinguished senator from Migori. And we are working on them, especially the equipment for search and rescue. And we have already made uh, progress. And the challenge has not been with equipment. And I believe um, more or less we have exhausted all the people that would have saved at the moment, unless they are rare cases, we've been able to uh, complete that process, unless there are rare cases which might emerge. The slow nature of the recovery of bodies is what I explained. It's a scientific process. It's governed by international protocols. And the way criminals of this nature operate, because it's organized crime, they don't just bury people. Part of the uh, work is to conceal the graves. So we are not just looking for places where we, as you know, looks like it was dug up. No. We are looking everywhere. What we've done in the last two weeks, we have opened security roads. Every hundred acres as a security road around it, out of the 800 acres. 100 acres is a security road around it, so that we can now do the search for graves and the identification of graves meter by meter, centimeter by centimeter, millimeter by millimeter. And it's a very 
very slow process. Some of the graves we this crook had grown some crops on top of the graves. So you find uh, some kunde, some vegetables growing on uh, a mass grave, just to cover up. Others, there are structures that looks like a house, inside is a grave. Others in very unlikely places. So that will take a bit of time. Um, deterrence, I agree with Senator Okech. It's one thing to to bring the crimes, <coughs> the elements of the crime, but this must be connected with the procedural, uh, you know, tightening of the process. To once you're suspected of certain crime, the procedure is different, and then now we strengthen our institutions so that that process is not abused. That's how other countries have, have uh, made some progress in this area have done. We make it impossible for the, the procedure to be abused so that if you disagree with somebody, either because of politics or whatever differences, you go and put them on a track for suspicion of terrorism so that they are kept. to deter future people. I also agree with the distinguished senator for Migori on the question of, yes, this mandate is about um, Shaka Hola, but I've seen your terms of reference chair also include general uh, uh, terrain, the general terrain of radicalization, indoctrination, by religious uh, groups, so if I've seen your mandate, I think it's general. What has not come out, and I agree with the Senator from Migori, is that we must now remove ourselves at some point from the specific suspect and look at this issue as one space called the religious uh, space and where and all these things operate. And I've been very careful all the time to say churches, most temples, houses of worship of whatever nature, including people who worship uh, uh, elsewhere and those who do not believe in God because there are those who say they are atheists. But I believe that the lack of faith is also that you, you don't believe in God, that is a faith. So they should be cornered there also, because they cannot say, oh, as we are not religious, but they lack faith in God. So they believe there is no God. So that is a faith. So nobody should be left out. Satan or others who worship whatever they worship, the ancestors, others don't worship anything worshipping anything. So, Mr. Chairman, nobody, I repeat, nobody should escape your dragnet. You must catch everybody, as suggested by our brother, the Senator from Migori. Chair, um, and, 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 and j j just one small item there, that there's a reason why there's uh, too much church-related attention because of this particular incident that caused all this inquiry and a particular preacher of the Christian faith. Uh, we should not be so obsessed with only that incident and forget uh, that faith that um, a few years ago, we had a similar upsurge of serious crimes globally, perpetuated by perverts of the Islamic faith. The 
some of it is still ongoing. This country has suffered a lot. Many countries in the world have suffered a lot by people who are causing mayhem and death, hiding under this. Measures we took in the early 2013, especially the Security Laws Amendment Act of 2014, which controversial city it was, by the way, is what has sustained this country. Uh, that those are the miscellaneous amendment laws. Now, so my view is that this incident that new addition to the existing framework. Otherwise, the framework is there, and you can excuse why the focus now is on the Christian faith because the perpetrator of the triggering national inquiry is uh, of the Christian faith. Um, lastly, why you know um, I was not trying to inhibit anything. In any case, lawmaking is a function of parliament. But you know, I'm a member of the executive. What the executive is or hopes will tackle. And because there is already a task force, executive initiated task force led by, uh, which was appointed by the president. because now there is an executive initiated process until it brings its recommendations, processes them through the appointing authority, and then now we can present them for incorporation into and the role of legislation is entirely uh, with the Houses of Parliament. Thank you. So, uh One question from Senator Vice Chair and uh, Senator Okoli and Senator Amida in that order. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, CS. You have really come out very strongly. And uh, say on the issue of the discovery of the two bodies for the minors. When we were uh, previously, when we visited, we, we were informed that those uh, two minors, the discovery, there was, there, there was a report. We were informed that the grandfather who went to report to the, he, he, actually he is the one who discovered those two minors with the help of the NGO. He went to report to police to get assistance, but was in vain. Yeah, so after he reported and repeatedly efforts to report to the police to get assistance, there was there was no help. So he he got the help from the NGO to go and uh, and help him to get the bodies of those two minors. And uh, after that, which was twentieth, twenty second, Mackenzie Mackenzie was taken to court. Yeah, and then in April nineteenth, that is a period of one month that Okoa Maisha thing came in. How did it take one month for the Okoa Maisha to come in after the discovery of the two minors and the bodies which were discovered by the headers? Yeah? And even after the reports to the police, but still there was no answer or any help from the police. I know you have come out very strongly to blame the judiciary, which I would agree with you 100%. Chair, and I would agree that we need to interrogate these uh, judiciaries who are here, uh, who were involved in these Mackenzie issues. And uh, I, I really want to tell you that when I see this, Mackenzie could not have done all he did as a person individual himself. He had a very big network. And that is what you need to get to the bottom of because what matters and what is important is the evidence. 
you have realized how the judiciary has been behaving. And most likely it is because of lack of very uh, strong evidence. And when we, if, if we don't tackle this issue, which you have said, there are still other issues existing in our country on the same nature, then we will never get anywhere. As you talk that we have lost the, the, the present, we will still be losing the future. And uh, also, you said that, uh, you came strongly to say that there is a legal document between Mackenzie and the people down there on the, on the ground. That document, I don't think it's legal. And that is the document which will be thrown out by the judges. If you think that is the document which will help us in court. Because judges would say this is not a legal binding document. We need the, the legal binding document, which is the title deed and the owners. And Mackenzie, what I see, he might even uh, be free because he has come out to say that land is not his. And true to his word, yes, the land is So, unless you have very strong evidence, and that is why we insisted on investigating those uh, officers who are on Because I, I, I would rather they were suspended or they were actually taken in for investigation to start immediately rather than them being transferred. I don't understand how. Now, on the issue of freedom, how free is freedom? Because you, you really insisted that freedom is enshrined in our constitution, which is very true, freedom of, uh, of worship. And here you came up with your proposal that individual ownership of churches should be banned throughout the country. Is that freedom? So I think we need to really see how best we can handle this thing because when we talk of freedom, uh, freedom with no limit, it can cause damage to the country and it has done already. So when I see this, uh, I really thank you so much. But uh, those are my few remarks. Thank you. Senator Wakoli. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. My question was uh, directed to Azidi. We have had interactions with the non government organizations that uh, have been involved in this operation. And uh, their perspective is that uh, the police is well funded to do this, uh, this operation, unlike other departments, like the pathologist, prisons department, children's department are well funded, the child care rehabilitation centers, as well as prisons who are, where suspects have been kept. Food and housing is a problem. Uh, would like to know, how, uh, how is the funding taking place? in these categories of uh, teams supporting in uh, this operation in Shakahola. Number two is uh, with the aspect that you've just talked about, the, 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 we interacted with Muslims, the Hindus, and there is a notion that uh, there has been a skewed approach in dealing with this radicalization matter. There is a belief that we are soft. High-handedness, stiff-neckedness that the other Muslim community has gone through in your pursuit to ensure that there is peace, tranquility, and uh, level playing ground. And finally, uh, to pick up from what my good sister said, information in our files indicate that there was a militia that worked with Mackenzie, that uh, under prior media reports, that some people had uh, in the, on their skulls or 
bodies, there are plant objects <coughs> that could have been used. So does it assure or justify that Mackenzie that he used to, you know, protect his operation, conceal the evidence, and therefore as he speaks or he operates today, he is innocent. Senator Amida. Thank you, Chair. I hope on the seats can take uh, one more. Um, it really seems that uh, Pastor Mackenzie had nine lives, or he still has nine lives. I mean, uh, according to what you have narrated, all this time you know he has escaped the jail. Uh, what I'm getting is I'm, I'm so, I feel so relieved that I'm getting the assurance from you, when I see us, that um, this matter um, will, will come, actually justice shall prevail. And uh, will hold you responsible for that, seriously. You can imagine the pain of all the families that are going through now, you know, exhuming the, the bodies of their loved ones. It's really, really painful. And I'm just wondering what kind of pain is Pastor Mackenzie going to feel? Um, when I see us, yesterday we had um, the PS for lands. And of course, in our files, it showed that the land uh, was was actually leased for about 45 years, since 1984, and ending 2029. 20, that's six years to go. Uh, the land was leased for IDPs, and now, like I said, I wanted you to—I mean, to continue. I mean, to narrate. I mean, to, to tell us about the land because now I was trying to get the connections. But then, when we asked for any evidence of the IDPs that were um, settled, none. There was no evidence of any IDPs. So the land was idle, actually. And for me, looking at it yesterday, it was more or less the conveyor belt of all evil. Because the government wasn't there, the security didn't have, you know, no intelligence for the Shakahola Chakama Ranch. And that ranch was, was actually, it was a ranch. And the, the, the government paid 100 million for the land, actually, you know, to be leased for the IDPs, and nothing was done. So just wondering, where, what is the taxpayer? Why, why would the, even the government, you know, do such a thing? But then there was no accountability for that. When I see us and you know, there, there was no kind, kind of, you know, real settlement, you know, for Kenyans, nothing, zero. So this, apart from Mackenzie, I'm still wondering also, were there other people who did the same? Are these bodies being exhumed? Are they just for Mackenzie or other, you know, other evil? So anybody would have played, you know, it was, it was a field. You have your own, you know, issues. Maybe that was the place. So for, for, for actually Mackenzie to have settled at that place, and comfortably doing what he could do yes. for years. I mean, it seems like, and imagine 45 years, the, 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 you know, the, the, the ranch is open. Any kind of evil would have taken place. So as much as, yes, Mackenzie has issues, what about the other people? And of course, we blame the government for this. What other evils did, uh, um, went on in, in Chakama Ranch? I'm also hoping that the mental health for police officers, actually I passed, we passed a motion, that was my motion for mental health. I'm sure that the mental health, and I would really want to get involved since I have a motion on mental health for police officers, at least that uh, should take place. Just one more, um, one more, uh, when I see is that um, at what point does the security agency get concerned uh, about the activities of a certain church or religious outfit? For example, we went to Kisumu and we actually forced ourselves to uh, Father John Pesas. And I remember we, we had uh, the vice chair, and she was actually we found about seven cases of people who have been locked in with chains, 
and lock and chain you can imagine so all these things are still going on and we, it's unfortunately we didn't have time we were actually told that there were uh, there were graves inside and he actually agreed that there were graves things unfortunately we didn't have time that day uh, to and father Pesa uh, he pretended to be quite uh, what is innocent but then the next day you know on interview he was quite harsh on us but then we found we actually released about seven to nine people who are locked in and who are of you know inside. so I'm just wondering at what time at what time uh, the, the Nigerians yesterday we had I think civil society coming with this human rights young people saying that they are Nigerian um, uh, yes who are, who are holding you know uh, the same kind of cult and it's going on in Kenya but they even even then they are scared because of the spiritual something so even the human rights imagine that so I'm just wondering where are we heading and at what point is the security coming in uh, Buenasias, but at least I'm get, we are getting that assurance from you. And I still commend you, Buenasias. What you've been doing, actually, you've been there throughout. You know, with the, uh, the uh, Chakama and as much. New graves, you can imagine digging in new graves over and, a row and over again and you're telling us you're going to a new site. It's true. One or two people is a 150 bonuses and imagine Kenyans are taking it as a norm, you know it's normal. Oh, leo ametoa 300, oh, leo ametoa 20, ah, we have a 30. Imagine the families that, you know, are left behind. But we are 350. Hell knows we could be at 600. What is the government going to do about it? The judiciary, seriously, they must answer to this. This is painful to Kenyans. This is, you know, it is a grave matter. It is indeed a grave matter. What are you letting us guys you know would have identified but then Chakama Ranch and we have any if we have any other ranches Buenasias going through the same kind of evils this must stop Asante. yes thank you Chairman, and thank you Buenasias for the presentation my concern is that uh, Mackenzie went under under the rad after Who, is, uh, who had called people and then because of the conmanship, he proceeded to murder them when they were asking questions on where the land they are screaming. in. Uh, this may not be a, a cult murder, this may not be cult murder, but this are uh, straightforward murder cases where somebody called uh, innocent people and when they started asking questions, Capacity of the police who are in the outer stations. You know, you in your presentation you said that several cases had collapsed before the magistrate's court at Malindi. Our proper investigators of those cases, I don't think those cases will have collapsed at that particular time. We may blame the courts, but you know the courts are independent arbiters. They are there to decide on the evidence that you present. If you don't have evidence, Whatever you do, even if you uh, you proceed to appeal, the appeal will be able to to vindicate the, the accused person. And you see how our courts now are becoming more and more liberal. 
The other day, the Court of Appeal abolished the life sentences. Now, you don't have uh, uh, capital offenses. Even if you are charged with a capital offense, you cannot be uh, 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 sentenced to hang. Even the uh, life imprisonment is also going to be abolished because the, the court has also said so. So we are delving into the realm of uh, the unknown. And I think we need a whole conversation on the on the justice system because we, the, the way the courts are going, we may not be able to have any any prisoner uh, in jail in the in the next twenty or so years. Thank you, Bona says, and the chairman. Thank you. Uh Uh, CS speaks. Uh, okay, so uh, CS, maybe you, as you speak on this, the case, the human rights organizations made a very strong uh, case that uh, the 95 adherents or followers of uh, Paul McKenzie, who are charged with attempted suicide, ought not to be treated as suspects in court. Uh, they ought not to have been charged. They ought to be treated as victims and therefore um, should be released. In fact, uh, very strong recommendation about repealing Section 226 of the penal court on uh, suicide altogether because this should be these are mental health uh, issues and should be supported other than uh, taking them within the realm of criminal law uh, maybe as you make your um, uh, statements about all the questions you may want to tell us uh, something on that and i see senator wakoli forgot one more thing uh, you finished that yeah thank you this is the last one to waziri uh, you've uh, elaborated the efforts by government to put behind bars Mshukiwa uh, Mackenzie. I see he was released on cash bail or bond and sureties of a million plus. I want to know if government has made any effort to know the source of these funds, who was with him and where the funds came from because this one can equally give us insight on his operations and allies. Thank you. Why is Mackenzie sleeping on a mattress and other suspects on the floor? We were given that information by NGO. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, CS, you can uh, just uh, tackle all those and then give your closing remarks because after you finish, we are done. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for the members. Um, when the children were reported to have been stuffed to death and buried in Shakahola, that was on 20th of March. The arrest took place two days later. Um, There could have been earlier reports to the police, which were not acted on. And that is a part of the accountability uh, mechanisms to be part of um, uh, the solution to the resolution of this matter. But immediate, and, and at that point, Chair, I thank the NGOs blew this thing and made it uh, you know a major issue initially and even after that uh, I just want to commend them they did a great and patriotic work because it's one thing to sit here and blame judiciary you blame police you blame everybody except yourself so there are many institutions and Kenyans who are not necessarily governments who have done a good job and I think about the civil society, uh, Aki Africa, Muhuri, 
Uh, and, and the others, they've done a good job. And even after that, they have remained active. They are partners with us in the accountability journey and the journey for justice. And you know, they would have easily said, it's not our work, we are not law enforcement officers. Why is this person coming to report? I don't want to get involved. And they go with other activities, so we must thank them. Same with our media. I think the media has done a brilliant, brilliant work. A matter as complex as this one would have been treated differently. Why not for the responsibility of our journalists? Uh, both Kenyan journalists and international journalists who have been covering that uh, massacre in Shakahola. Again, I'm grateful to these non-governmental actors. I'm also grateful to the Red Cross and the other humanitarian organizations and private citizens. There are people who have given their money daily, even to feed some of the officers in the operation. And I know a question was asked about funding. I'll respond to that. Private citizens. We honor them, and we'll find a way of recognizing them as part of closure. Quietly, without making a fuss about it, their job is to make sure there's water for the search and rescue teams, for the, you know all the teams there, the pathologists, providing them with soap, pocket money, supporting them with food where their budgets are restrained. So there are many heroes of this process. And also thank you, Senators, because you also took your time to visit there and see for yourself that situation there. It took about a month for us to start the operation because when the first crime was exposed, again because of the lapses which I have said had occurred on our part, yeah, we didn't know that what the situation is now is what it is that time until you know then another exposure mainly by ngos journalists another exposure then we realized come on this is much more serious and that's when we say this is large scale organized crime and that that took a bit of time for us to appreciate that we have just through our the support of the media and the journalists that we've just stumbled on a monumental tragedy. We didn't expect because of the lapses which I have said before. And for the second time, if not the third, on behalf of the previous administration where all these things began by virtue of what I have already stated here, and the current administration, I apologize to the people of Kenya that this should not have happened. This is the worst security breach that our country has ever experienced. The ownership business, it, it's not even for, from a criminal justice perspective, we are not bothered with that discussion. That is a different discussion of who owns the land. And I don't want to preempt the prosecution case, but that should be the least of our worries. All we need to show is the suspect was in control of that space. That's all. Whether he had stolen it, whether he had uh, entered into an agreement with fraud stars, there is the one who was preaching to them. If we have the evidence to show is the one who was preaching to people there, indoctrinating them there, supervising the kill. Doesn't matter whether he owned the land through a lease which is a legitimate lease or not, that is a different question altogether. Mental health. All those like me who have been in that space for, for a long time, for three months now, almost every week, I 
and even much more, the officers who are there daily, they report there every day. At least me, I go once a week. I've been there eight times. Support and chair, I want to say this. I am very proud of our officers, both from government and that work in Shakahola. They have surpassed our expectations. The focus, the patriotism is in another level. The empathy with the kind of work they are doing, they have taken it upon themselves that this is the most assigned, the most important assignment they are doing for this country. Some under very difficult circumstances. You can imagine people reporting to grave sites and mortuaries every day for three months. Exhume every day, children, women, old people, men. So we have a plan. We have a plan. There is an ongoing social, psychosocial support system. But even the group that will require strong de socialization are the grave diggers. Job, a great job. But that trauma, if it's not managed, can even be a future of security problem. Because every day they wake up to dig graves. So you don't know whether. that will give them a uh, transition into something else um, and absorb some of them into some of our systems and, and make sure that the, we don't withdraw them from that activity and release them back to society in their state. So we have a psychosocial, a psychosocial support system. will tell you it's not an easy thing. Some of the bodies are badly damaged um, and so forth and so on. Um, let me give this assurance here. Yeah. Let not the country worry will be held into account. Let there be no worry, because they will. But we are limited in terms of how fast we can act. Number two, we are limited by our own constitution, Article 47, on fair administrative action. You don't wake up and just interdict and whatever. Otherwise, they'll go to I've achieved uh, another level of uh, freedom. They can do anything. Um, that is our law, that is our country, that is our judiciary. So we have to be careful. But take it from me. Every officer of whatever agency who has a role in this through action or inaction without exception. And we are not going to look for junior people to hold accountable. We will hold everyone accountable. Whether they will be serving in office at that time all of that they will have left office. That is how we view this accountability journey. Yeah, aimlessly ends where my nose starts. That is the fundamental underlying philosophy to violate 
rights of other people, like those who are mutilating our girls and cutting their body parts. And they say, oh, it's our culture. That's all. Then they expose to, the, to them to grave health hazards for life. Then the third and final category is political extremism. Yes. Oh, we have political rights, we have democracy, we can do what we want, we have a freedom to assemble and demonstrate. It's true. Yeah, but don't don't just go to a meeting and and do your meeting and talk. And if you are a government, promote the policies of government in your meeting. If you're in the opposition, promote the opposition policies in the meeting. When the meeting is over, go home. Simple. The fact that you have a right to present a petition doesn't mean you have a right to ask uh, 50,000 people to storm a street or a town or, uh, you know, just close a road and people cannot uh, travel. And, and this is, uh, which constitution is that? These are the ingredients that erode our constitution order. That's how you destroy a country, slowly. Oh, I'm a preacher of the gospel, don't touch me. You're killing people. I'm a politician, I have a freedom to do whatever I want, let people demonstrate. And as early as 6 a.m., before even the meeting is called, is called People are looting other people's shops, criminals who are taking advantage of your meeting anyway. So uh, that's where we are. Our challenge is to strike a balance between the need to respect all the freedoms that our country through the Constitution has offered, but also respect the limitations that ensure public order, public safety, public morality. And that's where we are coming from. So all extremists of all types will be treated the same way because they, what they are causing is the same thing. Mr. Mackenzie has, uh, through his activities, uh, killed uh, the hundreds. Uh, other extremists are causing deaths of uh, maybe a lesser number, but they are still deaths of the people of Kenya. It must stop. And I mean it, Mr. Chair, it must stop. Um, then there was the question of um, the experience you had in Kisumu. There are so many, I have reports, very many reports, because the question was from Senator Amida was, at what point should security agencies get involved? It's a bit difficult. Let me tell you why, Chair. Because I've taken time to reflect on some of these matters. I'm not just speaking out of the blues. I've taken a lot of time. You know, public officials, including judges, members of parliament, and security officers, are also human beings. And they also worship. Some of them are members of some of the organizations that we think are criminal organizations. So that answers some of the questions you have. It's a much bigger problem than we are thinking. Yeah. And the reverence we have given this space is so high, you know, when already a, a security officer, a minister like myself, a, name, a senator like yourself, you're already a member of this organization that is perpetuating this. Tell me how easy it will be to be able to rely on you to address this issue. Let me give this assurance also. All criminals who are hiding in religion, in culture, in politics, we will stop them before they hurt us more. And we have no apologies to make to anybody. We'll stop them. Including members of the judiciary. 
because they are also human beings. So any person involved in crime, it doesn't matter, because your independence, your the space we have given you is not to commit crime. We'll come for you. Um, the source of funds, we have made a lot of progress on that area. Allow me not to say a lot of progress, and I thank the Senator for raising that issue. It was an important um, element of uh, successful prosecution. And uh, uh, did he have a militia? Yes. All the evidence is pointing to the existence of a militia whose work was to supervise death. are forced to continue with that process till the end. With tremendous respect, my distinguished professional senior, Senator Faki, the Senator of Mombasa, is wrong to say that the he has this hypothesis that this is a conman and when he asked questions um, he wanted to get rid of them no <coughs> this is a criminal who in collaboration with his uh, supporters and those who assisted him commit this offence, deliberately sat down and designed a well and carefully planned program to kill the people of Kenya using force and dangerous doctrine, period. If it was the economic issues, he would have dealt with the people buying land, and mainly it is men who buy land. Then when they disagree, he would kill the man. But to seduce a whole family to go and stay with him for months and kill the entire family, if it was a land transaction, he would have dealt with people who are speculation for land, and then it ends there. But the, what we are having there is uh, it will actually is a, is a complete elimination of his followers. As a religious group, members of GNI were targeted for complete elimination in the entire uh, the setup, the entire family. So I disagree. However, notwithstanding that, we are not ruling out any possibility. Even that aspect, we have not ruled out that there could be land and economic issues involved in our investigation, because it will be foolhardy to do so. With regard to the chairman's um, uh, proposal, the chairman of this committee, on uh, what the civil society has recommended, I don't want to venture there because of the controversies around suicide and uh, I have my personal views but I don't think it's, it's necessary at this stage to to share them but it's very a very controversial matter it's not as easy as the civil society organizations want us to believe because within the human rights jurisprudence what we have in human rights jurisprudence under international law and our constitution is the protection of the right to life. And in fact, it is that protection of the right to life that has led to the abolition of death penalty in Kenya and in other jurisdictions. That because of the sanctity, that the death penalty is an affront on the right to life because you're killing someone for whatever reason. They say 
It's an affront of the right to life. So the right to life, God gives lives, takes life. That is uh, some of the jurisprudence that has been obtaining. But I know in some countries, and uh, this is now what I'm seeing creeping into our Kenyan jurisdiction, is the jurisprudence of the right to die, which has been there in European countries and other Western countries for the last 20 years. And the argument is, a Chair, that as a human being, because I am a, a human being enjoys that, that fundamental and existential freedom, and I have the right to live, I also have the right to die. So if I want to take my life, why should, we gov why should government be bothered to force me to live? That is the philosophy that has led to some countries like the, the like the Netherlands, just as a way of example, to have laws on euthanasia, for example, or mass killing, what is known as mass killing, where somebody can be killed on medical grounds. And in between that human rights jurisprudence and philosophy, there is religious issues there. So I don't want to venture there. I'll get lost. <laughs> I will get lost so that. Uh, uh, whether or not a person has both the right to to live and the right to die, I am not sure. But as to the right to life, that one I am sure because it is universal, that it is one of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual. Very quickly, the funding, it is true, some of the teams we have supporting this operation are underfunded, but the problem is with the parents you know, the, I mean, because this is multi-agency. So you have the police part, which is an interior function. You have the pathologist, which is a Ministry of Health function. The government chemist is interior. You have others like children welfare, which is, uh, I think, social services. So it depends now on the, the parent ministry. For us in interior, we are making sure that all our teams there are funded. We have had to ask our county officers to reallocate funds because this is a national emergency and the quest for justice is extremely important for it to succeed. And we are there to support the teams every day. So the discrepancies are caused by uh, the fact that uh, it's beyond the Ministry of Interior. Uh, some of those agencies fall under other ministries. Um, the allegation that uh, the government is, uh, could be schooled, or the country could be schooled in favor of the Christian faith, at the expense of uh, the Muslim faith, is not true. When whatever measures were done, when we had a real problem with some criminals hiding in uh, madrasas and mosques, propagating dangerous doctrine and encouraging terror, we were very vicious. And we succeeded because the problem, the threat there then was being posed from that section of faith. Today, this threat has come from the Christian faith. So that's why I've repeated many times this deliberate chair. That ruthlessness, ruthlessness that we applied that time to deal with our Muslim brothers that time, we will use it on our Christian brothers and sisters, the same. So that also we tackle elements within Christianity who are causing the same harm as our brothers uh, in the Muslim faith that time. And I agree, we should also look also at other faiths and also persons of neutral faith. Mm, I think that is it. The militia thing I've answered. Or have I left anything else? Um, um, I think I've answered everything. Um, there was one question about the capacity of the police. Um, I think there is no particular institution here which is to blame. 
I believe there, is, there are many things that the police should have done differently. There are many things that the NIS should have done differently. There are many things that the ODPP should have done differently. And there are many things that the judiciary should have done differently. So I think uh, for me that is the summary of everything. And we are guilty as government. And the society is also guilty. Because if our brothers and sisters, the clergy, do not, or rather are truthful among themselves, they will tell us they have not helped us to weed out bad people in the elements. Instead, they are applying a tactic which was applied somewhere in one of the scriptures, which I don't want to quote, where somebody was asked, where is your brother? And he answered, I am not, it's not my business. That approach, it's not my business. You know, because I've heard our religious people talk, and I have a lot of respect for religious <coughs> leaders. Myself, I'm a son of uh, a clergy. So I mean business when I say this. I grew up as a child of a clergyman. You cannot tell us that it is the responsibility of government to expose the bad people. It's not our business. And with the other side of the mouth, you say, we don't want to be regulated, we want self-regulation. What are you telling us? You can't have both. Self-regulation means you must go out of our way to tell us. You should be the one calling government. Come, come, there is a party for a fellow there. Come, this fellow there is uh, ruining us. But you want to tell us, it's not my business. It's for security agencies to find out who is hurting people. At the same time, when we say, can we strengthen the systems to make sure that uh, you are accountable, you say, no, 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 we regulate ourselves. Food for thought. And I have a lot of respect for the bishops and the uh, archbishops and the apostles and the pastors, and I go to church every day, and I mean business. But these are the hard questions, and we will not spare anybody. We will not spare anybody. The God whom they preach. Um, and I remain at the disposal of this committee, even in writing. If you want anything written, we will prepare it. My closing remark is just to request that we do not bungle. We do not allow the prosecution to have an excuse why this case failed, yeah. because it must never fail. I'm a Kenyan. I know how we blame each other. When the time comes, God forbid, if the matter fails, we'll start saying, you know, there's some of the evidence, I don't know when this way. We as government has nothing to hide. We as government will not protect any person. If anybody ought to have done them, we'll make them accountable, including myself as the Minister for Kenya security. Thank you and God bless you. Good afternoon. Just, just before We have so far united uh, 20 um, from those that we had arrested. Of the DNA profiling process and matching, that one is to take a bit of time. And we, uh, there's very little we can do. But the teams there are working very hard.
the government's pathologist, Dr. Johansen Odwar, the government chemist, oh, all the teams there are doing a good job, and the homicide director. These are true heroes. I do not share just that, by the way. How come when, when, when are called to action, sometimes they perform so well? It just means even in the preventive side, if, if What we have done there is such a huge matter, even internationally, people are wondering how Kenya, without the support of foreigners, standards, using experts, their own experts. So, we, 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 will, we will delay that process because of the science involved. But there is also the reunification of the victims of Mr. Mackenzie's evil doctrine with their families. We may release some of them, but we must first stabilize them through the social, psychosocial process that I talked about. If you release them back in that nature, you can even lose them. As you're aware, even some who... Yeah, so again, that, that's a, we cannot, we have to handle them medically and make sure they can go back home. We have no intention of holding people's relatives for no reason. Then there is also some of them whom uh, who, has, who have given us uh, very good evidence, but the, their state of mind is improving. And every time we interview them, they are even clearer in their minds. And they are very hostile to what happened to them. So we will hold them for a while before we release them, to stabilize them, to give us information. And we will not punish, we may not punish uh, some of the things are secondary. If somebody was rescued, let me put it this, this way, without preempting the decision of the director of public prosecutions, because I have no uh, power to do so. These are my personal views. If somebody was arrested because he was a victim of this crook, and they have abandoned, or rather they have stopped processing the suicide mission. They have stopped their journey to suicide. They are giving police useful information. What tells, you know, the most important thing will be to help them stabilize medic medically and return them home, if you ask me. We will we'll be releasing people to their families in the soonest time possible. We will not punish innocent people, and we will not criminalize the third, 35 to 40 percent, who are forced to die by being struck with blunt objects, meaning they did they are changed. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We are grateful for all the insights you've given us. Uh, this committee continues to receive reports and 